Okay, now that we learned the relationship between the four cardinal signs of inflammation and the four Marx brothers, let's talk about the stimuli for acute inflammation. Well, many, many stimuli cause acute inflammation. They could be uh, infectious uh, agents. They could be physical agents such as trauma, radiation. They could be various chemicals. Tissue necrosis in itself is a stimulus for acute inflammation. Foreign bodies are a stimuli for acute, acute inflammation. And if the uh, agents uh, that cause acute inflammation are intrinsic to normal body antigens or normal body substances, this is frequently called immune or autoimmune diseases. So immune complexes can also trigger off acute or chronic inflammation, although it's usually chronic. Very, very first thing to happen after these stimuli are for the blood vessels to show increased flow and increased caliber. So the vessels dilate, and in the process of dilating, they also show increased permeability, and there is now leakage of fluid well, well, well before the cells ever decide or the neutrophils ever decide to uh, crawl out. There's leakage of fluid. Here are some events which either cause or result from the phenomenon of increased permeability. Well, dilatation is a cause, isn't it? Gaps in the endothelium would also be a cause, wouldn't it? If there is a direct injury to the uh, blood vessels or tissue, that would also result as uh, increased permeability and leakage of fluid. Don't forget, leukocyte injury uh, can also occur in association with this as well. Another effect or part of increased permeability is transocytosis. And remember, this is a passage of small fluid particles from one end of the endothelial cell to the others. Uh, it is, could be thought of as a combination of endo and exocytosis. Uh, last but not least, uh, increased permeability often triggers off the growth of new blood vessels as well, but that's usually in a later stage of acute inflammation. Let's talk about leakage of proteinaceous fluid. If the fluid has proteinate, a lot of protein in it, it is generally referred to as an exudate. If the fluid is basically pure water without fluid, it is called a transudate. So one of the main lab differences to determine exudate versus transudate is simply to see how much a protein is in there. A transudate would uh, occur with something that would not be quite as severe as an exudate because an exudate you have to have larger uh, holes for the substances to be released. Um, but nevertheless, after the dilatation of the vessels, we have leakage of fluid. And if fluid has a lot of protein in it, due to these various things we just talked about over here, then we call that exudate. After the uh, vessels have been dilated and are leaking fluid, we now have a stimulus for the polys or PMNs to do a few things. Well, the first thing they do is they travel at the margin of the uh, vessel and they start to uh, adhere towards the endothelium. And before they adhere, they actually start rolling and tumbling. You could see a bunch of movies like this on the internet. It's pretty spectacular. So first there's margination where the PMNs go towards the wall. Then they start to roll and tumble and heap upon themselves. And then they adhere to the endothelium. And last but not least, once they do that, they now go through the endothelium. They transmigrate. Another term for this is diapedesis. So not only do you have to remember these four separate processes, but you have to remember the proper order, which I hope is logical. There are a variety of adhesion molecules, which are all glycoproteins, and uh, they uh, actually occur uh, and are triggered off to um, uh, help this process of adhesion and transmigration. And they're generally uh, 
in the family of secretins and integrins. Secretins are secreted from basically endothelial cells. Integrins are from many, many cells. There's a whole wide variety of them, but I think from the purposes of general path and not physiology or cell biology or biochemistry, just remember the secretins and the integrins are crucial in this uh, white cell adhesion and transmigration uh, act. Now, after the uh, white cells have escaped from the blood vessel and are now outside of it, they go to the site of injury. And this process is called chemotaxis. And uh, there are a wide variety of uh, cytokines which govern this, which we'll talk about later. After the leukocytes have been triggered to go to the site of injury, there is now leukocyte activation, uh, which is a complex phenomenon involving several things. One of the things is that the uh, leukocytes produce uh, a wide variety of different types of eicosanoids or arachidonic acid derivatives. Uh, of which prostaglandin and prostaglandin-like compounds like thromboxanes are crucial in this chemical process. The leukotrienes are also a separate type of prostaglandin of uh, eicosanoid. And then the lipoxins are a third type, and the lipoxins generally counteract the leukotrienes. But rather than getting into the big uh, chemistry of it, let's just say that the end result is that the leukocytes will undergo degranulation. They will burst their lysosomes to do what the things in those lysosomes have to do. And they secrete uh, cytokines. And this is the process of leukocyte activation. It's both a chemical and a degranulation uh, type of process. Last but not least, the leukocytes have to recognize perhaps antigens, perhaps pathogens, perhaps dead tissue. They have to engulf it by the process of phagocytosis, and then they have to try to kill it. You now have, let's say theoretically, bacteria inside these neutrophils, and they have to digest it. So phagocytosis is another complex process involved in recognition of the uh, antigen or stimulus, engulfment, and then killing, uh, degradation, uh, digestion. Well, it seems like up until now, we've had a pretty uh, linear uh, description of the Cecil B. DeMille epic. It's been rather linear and it's been rather logical. We are now going to turn into a relatively uh, unlogical phase when we talk about chemical mediators. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of them, and we're going to go through all of the main ones. But let's spend one, this last minute, rather than try to memorize all the different ones and what they do, let's talk about what they all do. Let's talk about what chemical mediators do in general. Well, first of all, they are substances. They are generally proteins. They're released from either the plasma or cells, and they have triggering stimuli. They have stimuli which trigger them off to be released. They usually have specific targets, and they almost never work directly. They are often involved in a cascade, like the coagulation cascade or the uh, other cascades. Uh, in which they are just part of a chemical process to attach to something which causes another thing to trigger off and another thing. Last but not least, uh, as long as I have a few seconds left, is we can talk about the fact that the chemical mediators of acute inflammation are short-lived. After they do their job, they are quickly uh, degraded. So remember, these are the five processes or the five factors or the five properties of all chemical mediators, no matter which ones we talk about. And we're going to talk about a bunch. They're from either plasma or cells. They have triggering stimuli. They usually have relatively specific targets. These are part of a cascade, and they are short-lived. And I thank you very much.